Hey nerds, Dr. Jordan Breeding here with another episode of Your Brain on Crack, the only show on crack that costs over $500 million per episode. And now that you know that, you definitely wanna keep watching just to see where that money goes, right? That's because I tricked you with my tricks. Speaking of, is it unusual for most of the budget to go to the accountant? In today's fast-paced world of evening newspapers and 56 kilobit modems, it's not enough for a movie to say, hey, I'm pretty good. Come watch me! New movies must go to desperate lengths to stand out from all the Marvels and Star Wars is sucking the marrow from pop culture's bones, and by desperate lengths, I mean stupid lengths. And also desperate lengths. Such as... Netflix claims that viewers have spent 384 million hours watching Red Notice, which is maybe believable if 383.9 million of those hours occurred while people did laundry with the movie running in the background. Hell, I watched it twice and I still don't know what it's about. Anthropomorphic underwear telling young girls when they've officially become a woman? I don't know, I'll ask my laundry. Lots of underwear in there. Blood, too. What I can tell you is Red Notice is the most expensive movie Netflix has ever made because I read about 300,000 articles telling me just that. Never mind that a huge chunk of its supposed $200 million budget went to pandemic-related setbacks, or that Dwayne Johnson, Ryan Reynolds, and Wonder Woman all got $20 million each to method act as hot people for a couple hours. You look awful. But the high cost essentially became another marketing tool. The director even claimed in interviews that $200 million was lowballing it, because expensive means good, right? You want it? It's yours, my friend, as long as you have enough rubies. That's why the Yankees win every World Series, and everyone who drives a BMW is a charming, well-adjusted individual. Do you know how to f***ing drive? No. The last time Netflix pulled the- <laughs> Oh my god, this is so embarrassing. Don't look at how big my budget is. Was when they released Bright. Because you see, Bright, which at the time cost $90 million, used to be Netflix's most expensive original movie before getting red notified that it lost that prestigious honor. <laughs> <laughs> Piss off for a thousand years. It's understandable Netflix didn't want marketing to focus on the plot because while the slogan, fairy lives don't matter, feels icky. Fairy lives don't matter today. <laughs> but because Netflix kept saying, we paid enough for the lighting to be competent and you're too lazy to go to the theater, so why not click play, you lazy oaf? The message was that they didn't care if Bright was good as long as enough people watched it to satisfy some opaque internal milestone. Most movies at least pretend to be good, but Bright never aspired to be anything more than a casual hookup that did didn't require any movement whatsoever. <laughs> to be fair, an unusual emphasis on the accounting isn't always bad. After all, Game of Thrones bragged that its eighth season was its most expensive, and while I'm still catching up on the show, the first couple of seasons have been cool, so I'm excited to see what they'll do with a massive budget. I bet it's universally appealing. Maybe it really is all cooks in the end. And now Amazon won't shut up about how its Lord of the Rings prequel, The Rings of the Lords of the Power, is totally worth $465 million, so they could make like a billion rings that are like so powerful. Why shouldn't I f it? No need to be worried at all. I mean, the Hobbit trilogy cost over twice as much as the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and it was twice as good. Ah! 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 If you're tired of looking at my face, there's probably a video being advertised on YouTube's sidebar called something like Epic Awesome Sauce Trailer Breakdown. Will Batman be in the new Batman movie? You've seen these videos before. They're inexplicably 20 minutes long and have thumbnails coded in arrows and circles like they're picking apart the Zapruder film. Let's just for a moment speculate, shall we? There's an entire YouTube ecosystem around picking apart movie trailers with microscopic precision that makes biblical scholarship look laid back in comparison. Those are the demons. Even though all they're really doing is pointing out references intentionally placed in the background of trailers for 30 seconds and giving the movies free advertising for the next 19 and a half minutes. Now I know what you're thinking, uh, but Jordan, you love making YouTube talk is about the American moving picture industry. Some of those are literally two hours long and that's true, I love movies. And I've seen almost seven of them. Also, thanks for watching all the way from Serbia, like and subscribe. But trailers are increasingly created to cater specifically to hardcore core fans who love scrubbing frame by frame for Easter eggs then making their own videos about the hidden secrets they found like the saddest, shittiest Indiana Joneses, which is probably gonna be the plot of Indiana 5, but uh, maybe we should find a teaser trailer and scan it for clues first. <laughs> 
According to a CNBC article on the trailer industry, this trend, like so many of my personal problems, can be blamed on Star Wars. Specifically, the teaser for Star Wars Episode Four: Take Two, The Force Awakens. Its first trailer in 2014 basically just said, Sup dork, Star Wars is back. Don't look at it no matter what happens. <laughs> which caused said dorks, starved for Star Wars stimuli and human contact, to flood social media with guesses on everything from what the plot might be to the significance of the lightsaber colors. Apparently blue means you're lonely. Ever since then, trailers have been increasingly tweaked to appeal to the super nerds. Not just randos forced to suffer through a few ads in theaters before watching the new hit film Dwayne Johnson Makes Grunting Noises Probably in a Jungle, but also maybe in a view. By the time Star Wars 9 colon the legally dubious co-opting of the name Skywalker teaser started coming out five years later, legions of nerf herders gave the movie a free marketing blitz by attempting to puzzle out how every single moment might fit into the movie and whether Luke Skywalker's moil was lurking in the background somewhere. That's a circumcision joke, Dave. Just in case you didn't know. Again, I love fun just as much as the next Hillary Clinton. Did you hear my foreskin joke from earlier? <laughs> but treating every frame in a trailer like a jigsaw piece is how you start thinking of movies as nothing more than stitched together Wikipedia lore compilations instead of as emotional and or horny experiences. <laughs> It's also an easy way to paper over the fact that the movie being advertised sucks harder than a sarlacc sucking a Boba Fett through a straw, which brings us to, well, the rise of Skywalker. They fly now? They but also to Space Jam 2, strawberry flavored. That has gotta be some scrumptious jam. While that movie is ostensibly about LeBron going on a journey to acquire acting skills, and it's not white. What it's really about is Warner Brothers cramming as many references to their own properties into the film as humanly possible. Just the trailer sported, <laughs> because basketball. Granny's out here having a martini at halftime. References to everything from A Wizard of Oz to a Clockwork Orange. Two movies that only have a handful of basketball scenes between them. At one point, we even zoomed by a Game of Thrones planet, helpfully labeled Game of Thrones, for the benefit of the, shall we say, Sacramento Kings of viewers. The whole thing felt like an obnoxious rich kid showing off their toys, yet we still got thousands of videos with millions of views called Space Jam Trailer Breakdown. 4,000 very obvious Easter eggs you missed because you were doing literally anything else with your dumb life. But those weren't Easter eggs because Easter eggs are hidden for the benefit of the people who go out of their way to find them. Just like the original eggs full of salvation that were hidden by Jesus for the disciples on that first Easter. So long ago. King of the Jews. King of the Jews. This was just Warner Brothers milking free advertising from grown ass YouTubers pretending to be amazed at the sight of a whiteboard that says the Iron Giant. And this is what every franchise is doing now. So stay tuned for my next video. Your brain on cracked breakdown. 47 amazing Jordan facts you missed. Plus penis size reveal. Serious, seriously? Are you ser- are you serious? Boo! Ah! Did you like my scary side? If so, there's totally more of that coming. And if not, don't worry, because that's the last scary moment you'll ever see. Confused? Well, the horror genre has lots of fans, but it also tends to get looked down on because for every acclaimed spooker piece, there are about 5,000 where topless teenagers get haunted by the ghost of an alien axe murderer seeking revenge for being associated with such a terrible movie. And so to win over that audience without actually going through the trouble of making, ew, a horror movie. What's that? franchises have started promising that their latest installment is gonna be scary. But not too scary, God forbid. When promoting Doctor Strange 2, Metamucil Madness, Marvel czar Kevin Feige said that while he wouldn't call it a horror film, it will have legitimately scary sequences. Yeah, sure, like I'm a legitimate actor. <laughs> Feige also mentioned that the director, Scott Derrickson, has horror experience, which on its own wouldn't be too weird, except Marvel also leaned into that it's scary, but not like scary, scary angle for the cinematic war crime that was the new Mutants movie. I hate her too. They're doing it again with Moon Knight and whatever Ghost Rider project they're cooking up deep in Nick Cage's bowels. Hello. DC's lumbering promo engine did the same thing when director David F. Sandberg said he was told to lean into his horror roots for a certain scene in Shazam, a movie praised for being more lighthearted than DC's regular brooding glower fest. Hello, darkness, my old. And yeah, I guess they did manage to cram in one extended monster murder responsible for so much tonal whiplash that my neck still hurts. <laughs> Dude, 
Just messing around. Superhero movies face the unfair accusation that they're fluffy crap for kids just because a significant portion of their fans happen to be man children who threaten to strangle your dog whenever you mispronounce Theranos' name. I am John C. But you can't take too many creative risks when you're part of a billion dollar merchandising empire, so we're stuck with reams of interviews where everyone pretends that the next series to hit the Mickey Mouse family streaming platform is going to be Rose Marvel's baby. I like superhero movies, and I like peeking at horror movies through my fingers because they're scary, but we don't have to keep pretending that every slightly offbeat superhero flick is following in the footsteps of Stanley Kubrick. Either have the balls to make House of a Thousand Baby Yoda corpses, or stop trying to trick horror fans into sitting through Dr. Poontang for one scene where it's a little dark and a brief horse sting plays when the movie's requisite CGI blob pops. Ah! <laughs> Left my violin on, I guess. The Halo games are about Lieutenant John Halo's attempt to stop a coalition of aliens from doing a genocide, a goal he accomplishes by heroically using Marines as meat barriers until his shields recharge. I'm gonna pop the top off a can of whip ass. And aside from having a multiplayer mode that introduced many young gamers to an exciting variety of racial slurs, Halo is famous for its theme song a Gregorian chant that brings a sense of gravitas to the saga of John punching dumb little sweary alien guys in the back of the skull as they try to run away. <laughs> Naturally, when it came time to advertise the Halo TV series, Paramount dramatically ends the trailer on a self-serious cover of In the Air Tonight, just to really get you pumped for that action. Music has been used to promote movies ever since music was invented in 1907, but despite the existence of as many as five distinct genres of music today, slow and moody covers of popular songs from the 1970s to the 90s make up pretty much all the music used in modern trailers. The trend can probably be traced back to 2010 in the trailer for the MySpace drama, The Social Network, which used a choral version of Radiohead's Creep that made it sound like the creep in question was waiting for nightfall. So it could break into your house and lick your toes. Now, YouTube will immediately flag me if I play that song or do a cover of it, but it sounds a little something like this. <sighs> And ever since David Fincher revealed Mark Zuckerberg as the Zodiac Killer, trailers have been freaking obsessed with making yesteryear's hit songs a little spooky. The 2016 Blair Witch rehash that nobody watched used a slow breathy version of every breath you take. Well, the 2017 Ghost in the Shell rehash that no one watched used a wheezing techno gibberish version of Enjoy the Silence. These songs have nothing to do with the movies, it's just that if you breathily and slowly talk like this, you sound artsy and serious, even if the message is pretty stupid and maybe a little racist. Ooh. More recently, a teaser for Robert Pattinson's Man Bat remixed Nirvana's Something in the Way to give everything more epic gratitude, because the main problem with 90s grunge was always its criminal lack of inception. <laughs> Black Widow at least waited until the opening credits to play a cover of Smells Like Teen Spirit that was so exhaustingly self-serious that live journals just started spontaneously writing themselves. Even Gene Roddenberry's Dune, a movie set about 20,000 years in the future, built a trailer around the extra dramatic beats of Pink Floyd's Eclipse as reworked by Hans Zimmer. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with old music, and I get that studios don't want to use music from a super obscure band that only really cool people have heard of, like the infamous Randy Platypussies, or you know, my band. But as explicitly stated by a music supervisor at a trailer studio to a Guardian reporter, movie makers are terrified of taking risks. And they don't want to risk scaring away potential viewers with a song that they don't recognize from their heady days when they used to own an airbrushed titty van. But when every movie does it, it almost feels insulting. I've listened to music made in this millennium, guys. And I know that we all love Kurt Cobain, but he died back in 1984. We gotta move on.